All right. At the end of the show last week, we were discussing what is known as the occult season of sacrifice. And this is a 40-day period which begins at the spring equinox and proceeds to the midpoint of spring, which is known as Valpurgisnacht, St. Valpurgis's night. This is the fertility rites of spring. It's celebrated on the midnight between April 30th and May 1st. Generally, it is known as May Day. All right, this is the highest Sabbath of the year for occultists in general, but specifically for dark occultists. If you go to the What on Earth is Happening website, I have put up on the Radio Listen page, if you aren't already there, listening in through there, as I do for uh, shows that require imagery to be followed along with so that the concepts can be better conveyed. If you go up to the Radio Listen page, so go to What on Earth is Happening, click the Radio Listen page, and there you will see images for tonight's show, March 22, 2011. There will be two sections there. The first section is the occult season of sacrifice, consisting of three images. And then um, after that, I believe there are 13 images relating to Freemasonry, which we'll be getting into shortly. We left off covering image number two, and we had almost completed that last week. But if you look at image number one again, it shows you the zodiacal uh, wheel and the breakdown of the year according to the houses of the zodiac. Um, you see there the four occult sabbats depicted by the four great cross signs of the zodiac. These are the ruling houses of each season. So Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. Many people will recognize these as the biblical, the biblical lion, man, bull, and eagle. And eagle is associated with Scorpio because the Aquila constellation lies within or just near the house of Scorpio in the sky. So the lion being Leo, the man being Aquarius, the bull being Taurus, and the eagle being Scorpio. These each correspond, the midpoints of each of these houses of the zodiac correspond to a different occult Sabbath, being the midpoint of the respective season. In spring, the Sabbath is Valpurgis Noct, as I've already said, in season. The ruling sign Leo, the midpoint of which is Lamas, August 1st or midsummer. In autumn, the midpoint of Scorpio is the Sabbath known as Sowen or Hollow Mass, and that is October 31st. And the season of in the season of winter, winter the midpoint of Aquarius is February 2nd which is Candlemas, also known as Imbolc. So these are the four major Sabbaths, or holidays, if you will, of the occult year. In image number two, which is where we left off last week, I was explaining the general movement of the sun as it passes through the equinox point, specifically at the spring equinox, when it is coming out of the southern hemisphere with relation to the Earth, to the equator of the Earth, and into the northern hemisphere. So it is moving in its, in its um, apparent trajectory, in its apparent angle with relationship to the Earth. It is moving upward from its low point of the winter solstice, which is December 21st, 22nd, when it is at 23.5 degrees south latitude, that's the angle that it makes with respect to the Earth's equator. At that date, it is at the Tropic of Capricorn. That is the low point of the sun during the course of the year. It does not 
It does not get any farther south than that. Then it proceeds northward as the Earth moves in its orbit, in its yearly orbit around the sun. The apparent angle of the sun progresses northward until it reaches the equator, which is zero de a zero degree angle with respect to the Earth's plane of orbit around the sun. At that point, it is called an equinox. That's the time of the year that we call the equinox, the spring equinox or the fall equinox. When it's moving northward, that's the spring equinox, okay, because it's rising in power. The sun is rising in strength in the northern hemisphere. So it is at zero degrees, meaning that uh, the sun makes a zero degree angle with respect to the Earth's plane of orbit. Therefore, there are equal amounts of day and night during this time. The word equinox comes from Latin. Equa means equal and nox means night. So it's equal night, equal day and night. The spring equinox is celebrated on March 19th, and this is the biggest um, day on the occult calendar, basically. I, I know I said that it's Valpurgis Noct, which is the midpoint of spring, but this is even in specifically dark occult traditions viewed as an even higher holiday, okay? It's the beginning of what is known as the season of sacrifice, which ends at the midpoint of spring. And this year, we saw, indeed, on March 19th, a human sacrifice ritual begun. We began bombing the country of Libya. A long backstory to that, obviously, you could do the research yourself. It's under false pretenses. And uh, not to say that the dictator of that country is an, an evil human being, but, uh, you know, we're, we're there uh, not for the ostensible motives. Of course, we're there for natural resources, which we view as ours to, the United States views that, them as ours to take wherever and whenever we choose to do so. But that being aside, the political motivations aside, I told you to watch for an event during the season of sacrifice between March 19th and May 1st. And, you know, just like in Iraq, we went into Iraq on March 19th. Now we are going into Libya on March 19th, starting yet a third war. Uh, we're, we have wars waging, we're waging wars of imperialism and aggression uh, unconstitutionally, absolutely unconstitutionally, um, in three regions of the world now. And we have bases all over the world, but we're specifically waging undeclared wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and now in Libya. Um, this campaign was begun on March 19th. The occultists love this date, okay? And I was basically initiated into the dark occult on this date as well. And maybe in the future I'll actually scan some of the documentation that I still have, which is some of the very few documents I still do own from those days. Um, it's a long backstory to that. I went through a basically a spiritual purging at some point and not knowing that I was going to be speaking in this capacity or doing shows like this or presentations like I do because I was basically still somewhat under the mind control of dark occultism, I basically got rid of the vast majority of trappings and document documents that I once had, but I still do have a, a few of them. And uh, one of them is uh, an appointment that I received uh, as an initiate into the Church of Satan, and it was done on March 19th. So I'll probably maybe scan that in and put that up on the website in the future, or maybe even with this podcast, to show you just how much they love that date. They confer uh, rites and degrees and perform rituals on that date and initiate human sacrifice rituals like war, because as we covered in the previous weeks, war is indeed a human sacrifice ritual. And the people who march off to war basically are completely ignorant of what they're being used for. And they are ignorant beings. 
and people don't want to hear this. They get all kinds of offended about it, uh, calling soul dyers ignorant people, but that's what they are. They're ignorant. They're unread. They're ill-educated, whether they've actually received a Western education through the outcome-based education school system or not. I don't care what degrees you've gotten in the, um, you know, Soviet education system that we have here and the Nazi mastery learning education system of the West. Uh, that's a piece of paper that's utterly meaningless when it comes to holistic intelligence. And as far as holistic intelligence goes, these people are dumb. And there it is said out in the open and get as offended about it as you like. Okay? They don't understand what war is. They don't understand the occult. If they did understand the occult, they wouldn't be allowing themselves to be used in such capacities, and they would understand that the way to end war is not to fight them, to refuse to fight them, to refuse military service of any kind. And, you know, people can go into that cliché, uh, rote argument of people fought and died for my freedom. My freedom is inherent. And the only thing I need to do to secure it is to actually remain conscious of who and what I am. I don't need anybody fighting for my freedom. I am inherently free. I certainly don't need dumb people fighting for my freedom when, in fact, all they're really doing is fighting for elitists who are using them as pawns in a sick, twisted game of, of ritual sacrifice. And... You know, believe that that's not what war is and enjoy your belief system because these occultists are literally peeing in their pants laughing at the people who go off to war. And they're all too happy to tell you that they're pawns in their game. Like Henry Kissinger says, military men are dumb, stupid animals that we use in a game of foreign policy as pawns in our game of foreign policy telling you that they're chess pawns that are dispensable, that are disposable. Right to, right to their faces, and still these soldiers do their bidding. They call them soul dyers to their face. In the word soldier, soul dyer, and people don't think that this is some sort of occult uh, green language word pun because it's too simple or oh, you know, you're reading into things in the sound of words. Yeah, because that's how words are used and constructed by the people who invented languages. It goes back tens of thousands of years. And yes, that is what it means. A soldier, a soul dyer. Just like we'll look at in the future what the word police means. That's another form of occult mockery, which requires an understanding of Freemasonry to understand what it actually means, which is what we're going to cover later on tonight. And we're going to catch a bit of this right now when we look at this second image here, because understanding some Masonic symbolism will help us to understand a little bit about what the season of sacrifice actually is. Now, today is March 22nd. This is the third day, okay, of technically spring, all right? Occultists also love this day, dark occultists. Specifically, this is a Luciferian holiday, and it's connected with an order known as the Order of Death. And the Order of Death is about as high as you get in dark occultism, um, as far as being pawns in this whole system of, of occult networks. Because no matter how high you really get, it's all pawns. They're all pawns, ultimately, of the ruling bloodline families that are controlling the whole game here on Earth. And then you can look into, I generally don't do this when we when talking about things on this radio show or in my presentation, but there's much research that is done into the non-human aspects of what is going on, meaning non-corporeal entities, okay? Demons, if you will, or principalities. Some people also look into the extraterrestrial 
interventions that have taken place on this planet in the past and in the present. I generally don't get into that. I do have a presentation that talks about human origins uh, that I've given in the past, but I basically talk about things that I deeply know about on this show. And I leave that for people to go into and explore on their own. But if you believe that this agenda that's really taking place all around us is purely a human one, I think you have to jump through a lot of mental gymnastics to get there because ultimately it's about the destruction of human life as we know it. And it's ultimately about the destruction of human life, period, of any form of uh, human life that is worth living. And that's what the order of death, as we're going to get into in, in a moment, is actually about. And this is connected with the skull and bones order. It is often referred to as the order of death. And we'll talk about the symbolism of the skull and bones in a moment. But on this second slide here, I list the date March 22nd as being symbolic of the sun's position in relation to the equator that it has fully emerged from the southern hemisphere. Okay, the solar disk is not actually right on the equatorial line, that imaginary equatorial line at the center of the Earth's plane. Okay, of rotation. It has actually broken past that point, which is the zero degree angle, and it has moved fully into the northern hemisphere. So, occultists would say that on the third day, and this is obviously a symbolic analog to the sun savior astrotheology myth that we've talked about extensively as being the basis for Christianity. Okay, this is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, Horus in the Egyptian tradition, Tammuz in the Babylonian tradition, on and on and on, Dionysus, uh, Attis, you name it, tons and tons of gods, basically the same story. We covered that in the sections on astrotheology. On the third day after the spring equinox, the sun has fully broken the equatorial line and has emerged from its tomb, which is what the southern hemisphere is referred to as the six months that the sun is dwelling in the southern hemisphere or below the equatorial line of the earth. Okay, That's considered the season of death and then the other six months are considered the season of life or regeneration and growth because that's when you can plant and grow food. In the fall and winter season, you cannot. So you have to store things in the northern hemisphere, store supplies to get through the winter. So again, the order of death, or the dark occult in general, worships the dark side of the sun. Okay, They are a dark solar cult. In other words, they worship darkness. They worship death. They worship evil. So they, they basically give homage to the sun during the dark season. Okay? And this season of sacrifice is when the sun begins to emerge out of that dark season. Okay? So the point that it fully does this is, is March 22nd, which is today. All right, so today is a significant day in the occult. So I wrote here on this second slide that what this symbolically represents is the light bringer, Lucifer. Lucifer means light bringer, lux, fere, light, and bring. Okay, light bringer in Latin. All right, so we're basically looking at the high and low points of light or of the sun. This is all ultimately about the sun. And I, was, I left off last week looking at the first degree Masonic tracing board, which we're going to look at extensively tonight, if we can get to it in the second hour. And I'm going to be breaking this down in a couple of different orientations. Now, this is kind of a jump ahead, and we'll go back to this, but on this second slide here, I basically put 
the tracing board in its sideways orientation. And this is a depiction, again, of the sun during the course of the year. Okay? It's another way of looking at this. So the checkerboard floor that you see on the left of the image, right, and the direction is west, okay, the, those represent in this configuration, in this sideways configuration, the latitude and longitude lines of the Earth, okay? The latitude and longitude lines of the Earth. And west is away from the light or away from the gods, quote unquote, that you see there in the eastern portion of the image on the right-hand side where you see the letter E. Those are the gods of the ancient world as we talked about in the astrotheology section, the desert sky gods, the sun, the moon, and the stars and planets depicted by the all-seeing eye. Okay, the three desert sky god religions given to each one of these astrotheological cults of the ancient world, the sun given to Christianity, the moon to Islam, and the stars and planets to Judaism, the three major world religions monotheistic religions at that, okay? Now, we see north and south showing us the direction when it, when it, in relationship to the earth because north is toward the north hemisphere and south is toward the southern hemisphere. And that pillar in the middle, okay, with the ladder on it, which is known as Jacob's Ladder in Freemasonry, labeled with a W for wisdom, represents the equator in this image, okay, the zero degree point that the sun has now fully broken past as of today. And the bottom pillar, the dark pillar, the pillar of Boaz, labeled with a B for beauty, the moon, okay, represents the winter solstice. This is the low point of light, okay, the low point of the sun. December 21st, 22nd, the winter solstice, when the sun makes a 23 and a half degree angle with respect to the equator, south of the equator. This is the Tropic of Capricorn on the Earth. And then the high point of light is when the sun reaches the summer solstice, June 20th, 21st. That's when it makes a 23.5 degree northerly angle with respect to the Earth's equator. Or it is seen to be at the Tropic of Capricorn, 23.5 degrees north latitude of the Earth. So this is the pillar of Joaquin, or strength, labeled there with an S. So this is the sun's path during the course of a year. And it moves upward slowly until it crosses the midpoint of the equator, and then it moves up to its high point. Okay? We are now, symbolically, where that green initiate, that second initiate on the ladder would be. We have just broken northward into the, into the northern hemisphere, just broken the equator. Okay? On the right-hand side of this image, we see the cryptic tracing board of Tubal Cain. Now, this is associated with the Royal Arch degree of Freemasonry and higher, when you start to go toward the illuminated degrees, which are basically unspoken degrees. They are what some would consider clandestine degrees in, in illuminated masonry. Now that's more advanced, we'll get to that, but this tracing board, I put it on this image just to show you how this is symbolically depicting these two seasons. See, the, the ancients really only viewed two seasons, the time that the sun was in the northern hemisphere and the time it was in the southern hemisphere, that's it. They didn't really distinguish between spring spring and summer, or between fall and winter, okay? Spring and summer, the sun was in the north, where most people live, where the vast majority of the population of the earth lives, okay? So that's the favored season. The season of death is the southern hemisphere, and here depicted on this tracing board, you can see this dichotomy, but you can also understand um, symbolically what it spiritually represents, okay? And that's the key. 
there is there is an exoteric explanation and then there's an esoteric one to get, get to the true meaning, the veiled allegory that lies underneath the symbolism. And that's the key to Freemasonry. And you can only do that if you get out of the lo purely logical left brain and make a connection to the intuitive and creative and nurturing right brain. That's not to say throw out logic and reason. That's to say to integrate the sacred feminine, which is ultimately what true Freemasonry is about. And while I am doing this breakdown of this cryptic tracing board briefly, I want to say, before we even go into it, and I'll reiterate this, Freemasonry is not well understood by most people. Okay? And I'll be the first to tell you that the lodge system is degenerated and corrupt. But we have to be mature about our understanding of the real tradition versus what it has become. Okay? There is a true mystical esoteric tradition that underlies genuine Freemasonry. Then there is what it has come down to us in the modern day as. And that is altogether different from what I am attempting and endeavoring to explain to people as the genuine tradition of Freemasonry. So you could say there's a genuine Christian tradition as we've looked at, the true esoteric Christian tradition that emerged 2,000 years ago. And then there is what Christianity has come down to us as in the modern age, which is altogether different than that original tradition. Well, it's the same with Freemasonry. And we need to make that distinction clear and understand it well so that we don't you know, fall into this trap of, oh, all Freemasonry is bad or evil. You know, it's, 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 it's ridiculous as saying everything that you read in the Bible is bad or evil because you don't agree with what the Catholic Church or, the, or Christianity in, in general as a religion may be doing in the modern world. Okay? It's like you know, throwing out some of the tenets of Islam or Judaism because you don't particularly like the way that the leaders of those religions or even the radicals of those religions are taking that, you know, those, those uh, philosophies that are supposed to be ultimately the same core truths as, as all other mystical traditions and religions. It's just become corrupted over time. Okay? So, yes, do I attack religion as a form of mind control? Of course I do. And I explain all the astrotheological underpinnings of it and how people are basically being fooled into worshiping the gods of the sky and not understanding it. However, I've said before, there are deep um, allegorical underpinnings, which are really the mystical and esoteric truths that underlie all of these traditions. And that's what I'm endeavoring to get people to reach an understanding of through further study. And again, the other thing I'd like to make very clear is if you expect a 100% totality of this from me, uh, you're, you're going to be holding your breath. One person could not possibly give you all you need to know about this. You need to make an extensive study of it on your own. Okay? You need to go to a lot of different sources and be eclectic about the material that you're taking in, meaning take it in from a vast variety of sources. Okay? That's the best way to gauge any tradition or any form of information. So I can only give you a basic breakdown of this symbolism and, and these traditions. I couldn't possibly give, give a 100% um, exhaustive study of it. Again, as I said, that's a lifelong journey, basically. I'm still learning things about Freemasonry. All right, so this tracing board here of two volcano on image number two in the bottom right-hand corner of the image is showing these two seasons of the year, the light season or the favored season in the north being the top portion of the image, and also uh, depicted by the arch at the top, okay, symbolized by the arch. And then the, the squared portion at the bottom of this set half rectangular, half uh, 
ovoid image, okay, is the death season, okay, the season of darkness when the sun is in the southern hemisphere. And there is a form of a sarcophagus there. There you see the checkerboard floor of the house and you see light coming in from above. Now this represents soul death. This represents being in a state of base consciousness and the spirit is buried and it's in darkness. Okay? And that's what ultimately Freemasonry is attempting to do, to shine light upon the state of darkness that not only the world is in, but that each individual who is under a form of mind control or being hoodwinked is in. They're in a deplorable state of darkness, of not understanding natural law, they, which is the light of, of the creator. Okay? And you see that still streaming in from above. The idea is to dig your way out of that grave, to resurrect oneself by acquiring an understanding of natural law or receiving the light. As we said, it's, the Freemasonry is connected with Kabbalah. It means to receive Kabbalah. Okay? So, and oh, what you're ultimately receiving is the light or the knowledge of natural law, which the Creator put there. Okay? So, in the image, in the uh, uh, top portion of this image, once you do make your way out of that, you see the condition of the world, and it's in ruins. Okay? So they're, they're, they're showing you that enlightenment does not cast light upon something that is actually pretty. Okay? Yes, it's a wonderful thing, but it's showing you what our work really is. To improve a world that has gone completely awry and is in a state of disrepair and ruins, basically. And this tracing board is emblematic of that. It, it's, it's an allegory in symbol. So, I mean, we're going to be getting increasingly into more complex symbolism as we go into a study of Freemasonry and other tra traditions. Okay, so really, this is pre there's a lot of prerequisite understanding for a lot of this. Okay, so if you haven't listened to the previous podcast, do so and get caught up to this because, you know, again, there's, you can't build the top of a building before you build the foundation. And that's what we've done over the last year here. This is the 50-second uh, show, actually. So next week is the one-year anniversary of the What on Earth is Happening radio show. Pretty cool. So that's all I'll basically say on the uh, cryptic tracing board there in image number two. Let's move on to image number three for those who are following on the website. This is image number three in the occult season of sacrifice. Okay? on the radio listen page. So again, March 22nd is about the rising of the light or the sun breaking into the northern hemisphere. Now, there is again this occult order known as the order of death. And I label it here as I show the, the emblem of it, which is the skull and crossbones and the, and the numbers 322. Okay? And 322, again, is for, short for March 22nd, okay, because that's this, this first day in earnest of the season of sacrifice, the 40 days between um, March 22nd and May 1st, all right? So I label it here as the clandestine Freemasonic, the clandestine Masonic Lodge. I shouldn't even use the word Freemasonry in relation to this. Uh, it is a Masonic lodge of sorts, a clandestine one, known as the Order of the Skull and Bones. It operates out of Yale, Yale University. And, of course, they have, uh, their headquarters is known as the Tomb, okay, because this is a reference to the Southern Hemisphere. They are the worshipers of death and darkness. They're the Order of Death. And they pay homage to the sun in its dark aspect, a dark solar cult. The sun, when it is in its six months of its southern hemisphere dwelling, that, that, um, the lower six months of the zodiac in that 
configuration are often referred to as the tomb of the sun because it is, re is becoming resurrected or resurrecting to give new life to the earth during the season of spring, the season of resurrection, of rejuvenation. So when it was in the southern hemisphere, that's considered the tomb of the sun. And this order, the order of death or order of skull and bones, refers to its headquarters, its main meeting place as the tomb, which is a symbolic analog to the sun in the southern hemisphere, or the dark sun. Freemasonry has put this emblem on the third degree tracing board. Okay, so to understand the skull and bones, and I've alluded to this before, this is the emblem of the sorcerer. Okay, it's, it's a very slightly complex symbol. It only really involves two other symbols. Okay, it's the skull and the cross bones, the crossed bones. Okay, the skull is where thought takes place. And the bones are what we do our actions with. Okay, we use our arms, our hands. Okay, this is symbolic of thought and action. All right, so intelligence and willpower is what this symbol represents. And indeed, the members of the order of death are intelligent, and they have a lot of willpower. What's missing in this emblem is the heart or the spirit, care, true care. It's not there. The emblem of the sorcerer being equated with the skull and crossbones represents thought or intelligence being combined with will power or the will to act without care being present and indeed that's what a sorcerer is that's what a psychopath is that's what a dark occultist is a being that definitely has brought their thoughts and actions into unison but really has killed the spirit they have killed care they have cremated care, as we saw in their ritual at Bohemian Grove. This is depicted in the third degree tracing board, which you see there to the left of Freemasonry. And we'll get to a breakdown of this in later shows, probably not tonight. But I want to show you at least the depiction of the skull and bones on it. And this is a warning. All right? The, the, the third degree tracing board is about resurrection of the spirit and it's showing you that if care is killed that the allegorical savior in Freemasonry who is connected with the son Hiram Abiff okay the widow's son it's another allegory about the son which we'll get into tonight that if you kill care really you are spiritually dead you are in this coffin Okay, and no good can ultimately come to the world until you come out of that tomb, until the light rises out of that tomb. You can see there's a positive connotation to light bearer or Lucifer. And of course, Lucifer is connected with this tradition, the angel of light or the bearer of light, bringing the understanding of natural law to humanity. And then there's a dark aspect of Lucifer the dark side of the sun, meaning intelligence and will while care is still buried, which leads to psychopathy and ultimately to ruin, to chaos, not to order. And that's ultimately what the dark occult is, thrusting this world toward total chaos. And the unconscious idiots of this world continue to go along with their agenda because they're dumb, unread people who are still in this coffin because they don't care. And they don't want to change their actions. They don't want to use their intelligence or will in any way that uh, is directed by true care. 
they would rather just continue to be pawns and referred to as the dead by these people and uh, basically, uh, you know, mocked occultically and, you know, tagged with all kinds of occult symbolism and sent off to an altar of sacrifice and you know, just, just being completely ridiculed and mocked by people who know a million times more about them than they know about themselves. And they could just be made to dance like puppets on strings. Enjoy it, is what I say to the dumb people who are doing these occultists' bidding. And that means the military and the police. Because you are owned by the dark occult. The end. I don't care how much you want to deny that. It's the truth. You are owned by these people. Owned. They own you. Period. And because you know nothing about the human psyche, you know nothing of consciousness, you know nothing of the occult, and you remain horribly unread and ignorant, you're going to continue to do their evil bidding. Never understanding what you're being used for. Like a dog. Being led around on a leash. So, the third degree tracing board is a warning. It shows the skull and bones on the coffin of Hiram Abiff with the three tools that basically were used to kill Hiram Abiff, the spirit. Okay? And they're symbolic of the destruction of intelligence, the destruction of care, and the destruction of will or courage. So, these three tools refer to what, when they're used in conjunction with the murderers of Hiram Abiff, known as uh, Jubala, Jubalo, and Jubalum. We'll get to all of this, okay, in the breakdown of Freemasonry. Uh, they refer to ignorance, which kills intelligence, apathy, which kills care, and cowardice, which kills, uh, cowardice and laziness is more accurate, which kills, respectively, courage and will, okay? And I put there, the warning is that we have to always be on guard against these destroyers of spiritual awareness. These are what destroy consciousness. Ignorance, apathy, and cowardice slash laziness. One is a destroyer of thought, the other is a destroyer of emotion, and the other is a destroyer of action. And that's it. If we fall prey to these, we end up in the grave. And when the spirit dies, we're ruled by dark occultists. Dark occultists, the skull and bones. The order of death. So to wrap up the season of sacrifice, it is the 40-day period between March 22nd and May 1st, Valpurgis Noct. It, it is a throwback to ancient solar cults, all right, sun-worshipping traditions. They often offered animal and human sacrifices during this season because they believed that blood needed to be given, which was the life force, the life is in the blood, needed to be given to the earth and the sun god in order to ensure a bountiful harvest during the planting season, during the, the, the reaping season, okay, the harvest season, but you made the sacrifice during the planting season, which is early spring. That's what this is ultimately about. That's why they give, in the modern day, blood to the earth in all different forms during this year. We showed examples of that last week. Okay, they start wars during this season. Manchurian candidate situations come up over and over again during the season. Martin Luther King was killed during the season. Columbine High School massacre happened during this season. Virginia Tech school shooting happened during this season. On and on and on. So there you see it visually depicted. The spring equinox, March 19th, 20th, which is the beginning of Aries, and then at the midpoint of Taurus, that's the end of the season of sacrifice, at the Sabbath midpoint, May 1st, Valpurgis Noct. And I put up at the top on the right-hand side of this image that 
be particularly vigilant for false flag events and potential human sacrifice rituals during this time period. Okay. I, I also put in the middle of the image there that the season in Christianity known as Lent, which is a season to make a sacrifice, to give up something, okay, because the, uh, Jesus symbolically gave his life, life up. Okay, in, in the Christian, exoteric Christian tr tradition, they b believe in this as a literal story that Jesus gave his life up as the Son of God to redeem the sins of the people of the earth. But it's about the Son, okay, giving up his life to continuously rejuvenate the earth. That's ultimately what it is about. The Son continuously gives off us of its energy, its light, its warmth, its heat, etc. It's, it's the ability to have any life on the planet, to grow anything. Okay? And Lent... In the, in the Christian tradition, in the exoteric Christian tradition, is known as a time to make a sacrifice. And as I wrote here, this is simply a proxy, okay, meaning that it is something that is uh, really uh, veiled over top of the real season of sacrifice, which is about this um, sacrifice of pagan sun cults to give blood to the earth and the sun. So that's what the real season of sacrifice is about, and it's still ongoing, ladies and gentlemen. These are cultists who are directing world events because they control the monetary system and can be, basically make the idiots of this world that believe in something that's fake called money do whatever they want them to do as a result of promising them any amounts of money, okay? Can basically orchestrate world events because they own the monetary system. They invented it. And therefore, they can make people dance like puppets to any tune they want them to dance to because they're still so unconscious, these people, these puppets, that they don't understand money is fake, that they don't understand that they're ruled by dark occultists. But believe what you want and enjoy what you have, is what I say. To, to people who are reluctant to accept this, who are reluctant to believe that this is what the world is, I say, go back to believing whatever you want to believe and go back to sleep and enjoy what you have. That's it. You don't want to look into it further? Shut the show off now. Go watch some television and eat a nice poison-laden meal while you're doing it and enjoy being a kept pet. Okay? Because that's what 90% of the people of this world are or better, a kept pet. I, for one, am tired of that condition. I'm not in that condition. No one owns me. I'm not a kept pet. I certainly am not going to do anybody's bidding for a paycheck because somebody tells me that they think that this is what's the right thing to do. I'm going to find out, based on my personal study, drive, and will, to know what is true and what is real, what the right thing to do really is. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing and will continue to do what I'm doing. But because unconscious, ignorant people are easy to manipulate, it's real easy to sell somebody on going off to war or becoming a cop or doing any number of other things that are completely antithetical to natural law and believing that they're doing the right thing. So. Continue to believe that if you want, and enjoy what you have, and enjoy being a kept pet. But that's the season of sacrifice, and I will continue to tell people, watch these 40 days, watch for events during these 40 days, and specifically, they, they love the very beginning of spring, March 19th, 20th. They love those dates. I'm going to tell you another date, date they love, April 20th. They love April 20th. These dark occultists are reptilian in their patterns. They do the same thing over and over. They stay with what they know. Okay? And once 
you understand their patterns, it's easy to, to see where they're going with these things. But you have to be conscious enough to recognize the pattern. They love April 20th because it's Hitler's birthday. April 20th, Hitler's birthday. They did the Gulf uh, oil disaster during that time. Drilled so deep into the earth it cracked some sort of a fissure. And who knows what that material was. Some people say it was a mud volcano. I don't think it was entirely crude oil. But uh, they basically attempted to devastate the entire um, Gulf region last year on that date. And this year, you're seeing the bombing of Libya and the Japan tsunami and subsequent uh, nuclear disaster happening right around this time period. Again, as I said last week a bit early, that was on 311, but 11 is another uh, ritual date that they love because it's the number of chaos and opposition. Like 9-11. So that's where I'll wrap up the occult season of sacrifice. I think we've covered it. There's images there to look at and you can look into it further in your own studies. In the second hour, I'm going to be connecting into Oracle Broadcasting in a few moments, and we will be looking into the tradition of Freemasonry during the second hour. Now, just uh, as a prelude to uh, the second hour of the show tonight, I just want to lead in with saying once again that I'll be covering Freemasonry for many weeks to come. I'll probably be looking at this tradition like we did with uh, Kabbalah and Tarot over multiple weeks. So we'll do an hour of it tonight and at least two more whole shows, maybe three, okay, after tonight. The first thing I want to let people know is that, one, on this show, you will not be getting a 100% comprehensive view. As I said before, this is a lifelong study. If you're going to study Kabbalah or Tarot or Freemasonry or any other occult tradition, it's basically something that you need to make a personal investigation of over a long period of time. Because enlightenment is not an instantaneous process, which is all what all all of these traditions are ultimately about, and it's a stepwise process requiring time. If you think you're going to immediately reach some form of deep level of understanding overnight, good luck. It doesn't work that way. It requires time, effort, study, dedication, willpower, okay, all of these things. It requires opening your mind, the right brain aspect. It requires associative thinking, as we've talked about over the past weeks when we're looking deeply into different forms of symbolism. Okay? All of these things are required. They're prerequisites for studying any of these occult traditions and understanding the real meaning of them, not fear-based propaganda that is put out there by people who know very little of them. All right? The second thing I want to make people very clear about is that as with Kabbalah and any other occult tradition, it is not one thing. There is a dark side to it as well. I will be teaching the positive light side of it, but of course the mystery traditions have been perverted over time and turned into something that they were not originally intended to be. All right? So therefore... We have to be aware there is, of course, a dark side to this. That's why I'm not involved in the official lodge system of Freemasonry in the modern day. It has been taken over. And the tradition is watered down, and it has become something that it was not originally intended to be, which is basically a, 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 a club for influential people who then can do things clandestinely or under the cloak of darkness. And that's not what Freemasonry was originally about. So we'll be looking at this tradition, looking at some of its origins and its symbols, 
and its allegories in the next hour. So that's hour number one. I'm going to get ready now to connect into Oracle Broadcasting, and we'll listen to the tail end of some of what they're doing. And then Bob Tuscan from uh, the Intel Hub Radio Show will be introducing me for the second hour. So here we go. I'm going to more information. Please visit the website at www.freeyourmindconference.com. That's freeyourmindconference.com. All right. So, again, in the last hour, we wrapped up talking about the season of sacrifice. Now we're going to begin, and this will be ongoing over many weeks, into looking into the tradition of Freemasonry and what it really, truly is. Because there's a lot of confusion about what Freemasonry is, and a lot of people uh, continue to make the mistake of thinking that it is about only one thing and not understanding that there is a, uh, a, a dual side to Freemasonry, that there is a positive aspect of this tradition and then there is a corruption or a perversion of it, as dark occultists always do. And in fact, that's all they can ever do. Dark occultists, as I've been trying to hammer into people to get them to understand, do not create... Okay? They do not invent new things. They take things that are already there and use them to their benefit, to their selfish, egoic benefit. So they don't create anything. All right? The mystery traditions were already in existence before the dark occult came and took them over. All right? The dark occult perverts. It perverts. It uses something that's already there to its selfish aims and ends. That's all it does. So, in its original unadulterated form, okay, what Freemasonry is ultimately about, and, I, and this is my basic definition for it, okay, is a tradition in which natural law, which we've talked about extensively on this show, and which I've done a whole presentation on, and I believe that was show number 36, if people want to go back and look into my breakdown of natural law, Freemasonry is a tradition in which natural law and morality is taught through a system of symbols, allegories, and rituals. That is what Freemasonry is in its unadulterated form. Okay? Now, in the modern day, is it effectively doing that? I would say it is not. Has it fallen? Okay? Largely. Maybe not entirely, but has it fallen from its original intent? Absolutely. Has it become something that is essentially something completely other than what it was originally intended to be and do? I believe that it has. And that's a deplorable state. It's a deplorable condition, but that happens to be what is. Okay? So what I'm going to endeavor to teach here over the next several weeks is what this tradition really is about, and then illustrate this through the symbolism of Freemasonry or what is known as the craft, okay? So I want to direct people up to my website for the imagery that goes along with the concepts that I'll be breaking down. You go to whatonearthishappening.com, whatonearthishappening.com, click on the radio listen page, which is the button on the upper, the image on the upper left-hand side of the website. It says listen live, okay? You click that, it'll take you to the player page, and underneath the player plug-in, you will see listed there images for tonight's show, March 22nd, and there will be two sections, Season of Sacrifice and Freemasonry. We'll be beginning in this uh, segment with the Freemasonry imagery, okay? So before we do that, I want to make another definition very clear to people, and that is... What Freemasonry ultimately is, is a system that teaches through something known as allegory, okay? This is basic associative thinking, all right? What an allegory is, is a story or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, okay? There's that word, hidden. Occult means hidden. This is indeed an occult tradition. 
it is veiling its teachings. And it's veiling them for a number of reasons. We talked about why occultism veils what it, you know, conceals its teachings in the past. It does it for two reasons. In its dark form of occultism, it veils it because it's trying to keep that knowledge from people that it wants to wield influence over and use that knowledge as a weapon. In its positive influence, occultism may have veiled its teachings because it is too dangerous, physically dangerous, for it to teach these teachings in the open. And it may also, uh, and I believe erroneously, worry that, these, that this knowledge will be taken by people in a very egoic state and used as a weapon. So therefore, it veils it and attempts to keep it from uh, the hands of what it considers profane people. Now, I think that both of these are in error. Both of these stances are in error. And I've said multiple times on this show, and will continue to repeat the phrase, that humanity will never be free until the occult is no longer the occult. Meaning, until this knowledge is taken out of its veiled form, put out into the light of day, and it becomes common sense, human beings are going to be continuously enslaved because this is knowledge that people need to know about themselves. And it's a, it's a procedure of studying the self. That's ultimately what it's about. And ultimately, it's a science for understanding how suffering is created through going against natural law principles. And it's a science for getting back into harmony with those natural law principles by understanding the self and then changing one's behavior in accordance with that truth. Okay? So, an allegory, which is what Freemasonry ultimately is, is a story or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden or occulted meaning, typically a moral or a political one. That's what an allegory actually is. And I believe that's the uh, break music, so we'll pick up on that. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back on the What on Earth is Happening segment of the Intel Hub Radio Show. I'm your host, Mark Passio. On my website, whatonearthishappening.com, on the radio listen page, in the section of images uh, entitled Freemasonry, we're going to begin with image number one there, and that is is a large image showing the basic structure of Freemasonry. Now, this shows two different rites of Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite and the York Rite. Okay, the Scottish Rite has 30, 32 degrees or steps there depicted symbolically on this pyramidal structure that you see here in this image. Okay. Uh, they're known as degrees that are conferred to the initiates of this tradi tradition. And uh, it ends in the honorary 33rd degree. On the right-hand side of the image, we see the York Rite, okay, which has 10 degrees, ending in the Knights Templar degree, uh, which is at that same level as the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite. Now, you'll see that this entire structure here is built upon these first three steps at the bottom, the three degrees, which are the first, second, and third initiatory degrees of Freemasonry. The first degree is known as the Entered Apprentice, the second degree as the Fellow Craft, and the third degree as the Master Mason. These first three initiate, initiatory degrees comprise what is known as the Blue Lodge. The degrees from degree four to 32 in the Scottish Rite comprise what is known as the Red Lodge. And then degrees 33 and on comprise what is referred to as the White Lodge. And I would add that those illuminated degrees or higher level degrees above the 32nd degree of the Red Lodge would not only be the White Lodge degrees, but also the Black Lodge degrees. Okay, so at that level, you have positive higher level initiates or illuminated masons and also negative or dark masons. And I would say that that is reflected throughout this entire structure. Okay, 
one of the things I want to point out is the similarity of this hierarchical system with this, the hierarchical structure of control that we've talked about previously on this radio show. Any control-based institution, no matter which one you look at, it could be the military, the police, government, the education system, the media, you name it, okay? Any, uh, any corporation in general is structured in two basic ways. The first is hierarchy. This means it contains a system or a chain of command, okay? A system of degrees of some sort, as does Freemasonry, at least in the official lodge form of Freemasonry. Now, the official lodge form of Freemasonry is essentially not what I'm going to really be initiating people into as part of this show. I'm going to be taking them into the original core teachings of what this tradition was about. And this dates back far beyond where the lodge system came into existence. Okay? The, Freemasonry is an ancient tradition. It is one of the mystery traditions of consciousness that dates right back into the ancient world. Okay? This goes back thousands of years, not just hundreds. Okay? And one of the principal places that it originates is Egypt. And Egypt then was not known as Egypt. It was called Kemet. K-M-T. Okay? And this means black, or the black land, okay? It's a place of mysteries. It's the place where people were initiated into the mysteries, the mystery traditions of consciousness. And Freemasonry is one of these traditions. Now, it was likely not called Freemasonry there, but it was associated with building. And Freemasonry is, of course, associated with building. And here you see this pyramid structure, which I'm referring to, uh, just like the pyramids of Egypt are built in this configuration, okay, with a broad base containing, you know, a whole lot of substance and material until you get up to the apex, which tapers off, okay? So you have a lot of low-level initiates, and then as you know, you go higher up into the knowledge, there's less and less people holding it. So this is hierarchy, okay? The second factor of any system of control or any system that is based in this pyramid structure is compartmentalization. We talked about that, being how uh, in this system of hierarchy, uh, the people who do know the agenda at the top will often be very, um, will often keep the total knowledge of that agenda from the lower level initiates. And indeed, this is what is happening in the Lodge system of today because Freemasonry has been steered in quite a different direction from its original roots and intents, and it is being used uh, as a system of control. For me to deny that would be lying. I mean, you know, let's be honest about it. However, it becomes all too easy because we do recognize that to think that the entire tradition should be thrown out. You know, the idea of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Okay? We need to understand what the original teachings of this tradition are about so that we understand it is simply something that has become perverted over time, just like every other religion has. We talked about what the esoteric core teachings of religions are versus what they have come down to us as in the modern world, which are essentially systems of mind control. Is Freemasonry any different? Not really. Okay? So to get to the original traditions, we have to understand it's older than we're being told. It does date to the ancient mystery traditions. And that goes back to Egypt or Kemet, okay, the, the black land, okay, uh, this is the root of the word alchemy, okay? The Kemetians, the Egyptian people who studied the mystery traditions, not all of them, but the, the, the initiates into these traditions and, and keepers of this knowledge, uh, they considered themselves shining beacons of light, teachers who were keeping a tradition from time immemorial of how natural law worked 
and how important truly understanding natural law and living in harmony with it as a moral being, as a moral being, was to maintaining order in the world. Okay? So they looked at themselves as, as beacons of light who were way showers, okay, in a, a world, essentially, that needed to receive these teachings, that needed to receive the light, that was basically falling from its understanding of natural law and falling deeper and deeper into ego and worldly identification, as we've talked about extensively on this show. Okay, the barriers to true self-realization, okay, worldly identification, five sense identification, and ego identification. All right, things that prevent us from really understanding who and what we truly are, and what we're what what this is all about, what we're here to actually do. So, the the uh, the teachings of Chem, okay, were really these mystery traditions were encoded into a system of symbols and allegorical lessons, all right, stories, parables, etc., that convey a lesson about what's really going on in the world around us. This is the most um, done in the modern day through movies. Movies teach through allegory. There's many allegorical movies. As a matter of fact, most movies are allegorical that are basically teaching some sort of a lesson and aren't just enter for entertainment value. And this can also be done for the negative. It can be, you know, predictive programming and a form of mind control and, you know, uh, uh, basically steering one's perceptions in a certain direction through, uh, through movies as well. But allegorical movies are basically movies about the real world but they're told in a fictional story to get people to relate the story to what's really going on around them. You know, things like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, um, uh, The Matrix, They Live. I mean, you can name a million of them. You can go on and on. These are allegorical movies, okay? Freemasonry is an allegory as well. It's done largely through its symbols and its rituals. These are what the allegories in Freemasonry are about. To understand allegory, however, requires the right brain to be activated because it is about associative thinking. It is not just pure logical left brain thinking. And here's the break music. We'll be right back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back with What on Earth is Happening. This is the last segment for tonight. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com, we're talking about Freemasonry. Before we jump back into that topic, I want to give the call-in number if there's anyone listening out there that wants to call in to take us out, basically, 866-841-1065. Uh, call-in number, 866-841-1065. That's toll-free. So um, I, in this last segment, I want to attempt to break down one of the main symbols of Freemasonry. Uh, and if anybody calls in, we'll, we'll get to them. But... Uh, that is the, the compasses and square with the G in the middle of them. Uh, I'm sure just about everyone has seen this at some point or another. And I'd like to um, basically explain what this symbol represents and break down all of the components of it. So in the configuration with its point at the bottom, uh, this is now image number two if you're following along on the website, the compasses and square with the G. And there's a couple of stylized interpretations of them. Image number, image number um, two and three shows this symbol, okay? The square in this configuration represents base consciousness, okay? It represents um, essentially a low state of awareness, or a low state of understanding, not being able to see large-scale patterns because one is in a state of imbalance, okay? You could not possibly balance a square like that. It is also rigid. It is unyielding. It is difficult to teach, 
okay, or be, to become supple or bending, okay, to receive new information. A 90 degree angle like that is not essentially found in nature, so it has gone away from its true nature, okay? The square as a shape traditionally is used to represent earth-bound awareness, earth, earthly identification, meaning materialism, okay? Meaning um, ego-based thinking, okay? Selfishness, n not care for others, all right? Worldly identification and awareness. In other words, being trapped in the base part of the consciousness and brain. We talked about how the brain has so much to do with our level of consciousness and what our behavior eventually manifests like, okay? We talked about the components of the brain. Well, this part of this symbol would be analogous to the R complex of the brain, okay, in this configuration, in this, in this, uh, with, with its point down like that, okay? It, it's, it's representing uh, the state where you are ruled by base consciousness. You don't have rulership over yourself, essentially, all right? You are so stuck in material worldview and base consciousness that essentially you are ruled by your instinct and ruled by the passions, okay? That's what the square in general represents. And since it traces this imperfected shape, okay, that in traditional symbolism has been used to represent the lower world, okay, or the material plane only, divorced from spirit, essentially. That's what the square at the bottom, okay, at the low point of this symbol represents. The compasses, on the other hand, which you'll see depicted as being placed over the square, okay, represent coming upward in consciousness to a place of balance, all right, to a place of higher understanding, moving off of the square as a shape symbolically. Now the compasses trace a circle. The circle, traditionally in symbolism, is used to represent the divine or the higher world. It's used to represent cosmic consciousness. It's used to represent the break with the identification of the material and the incorporation of spirit, of spiritual understanding. Okay? So the compasses trace what is considered the divine shape, the circle, the perfected shape. The circle has no beginning and no end. It has no rough edges. It is the perfect shape. It is based on a number that cannot be essentially defined with accuracy, pi. Okay? It's a, it's a divine proportion. Okay? The circle is the shape used essentially to represent perfection and the divine and higher consciousness. The compasses are a symbolic analog to those concepts, okay? And the word, there's word play involved here as well. Compasses form the basis of the word compassion, okay? These are flexible, okay? They bend, okay? They're not rigid. This implies teachability. This implies going along with the flow of creation as opposed to attempting to buck that flow, okay, as opposed to going against that natural law, all right? The compasses represent having attained higher spiritual awareness through that G in the middle, okay, which is the all-important part of this symbolism. Now, the G has stood for many things. 
okay? But it's the way that we need to go through to get out of that base material identification represented by the square and to a place of higher spiritual awareness and compassion, okay? So the G, people will say it stands for geometry, and that is one of the things that it stands for, okay? These are shapes. These are geometers tools. These are drawing tools, okay? However, it means so much more than that. And I'm going to give a quick list, and we'll probably end there tonight, of some of the things that the G does represent. And I want to get to the main thing that it represents, hopefully. If not, we'll do that next week. Okay? The G has stood for geometry, the, the grand or great architect of the universe, G-A-O-T-U, which is essentially another way of saying God. But essentially, in Freemasonry, God is looked at as an architect, a creator one who has put the divine plan into manifestation and has created the physical world, okay? So it represents God. It also represents Goddess because, again, this G in the middle is actually the emotional qualities of the self, okay? We, we have to essentially incorporate our emotional makeup to, to make our emotional makeup much more mature, than what it is when we're young, to become emotional adults, to go through that transition from uh, ego-based identification to true compassionate awareness. And that's done through the goddess aspect of ourselves. So that's also what that G represents, the sacred feminine. It also re represents gnosis. The way of getting out of suffering is knowledge, experientially derived, or gnosis, okay, the Greek word for knowledge. It represents good, okay, or in, in other words, harmony with the natural law. It can be used to represent the word green because that is the, the frequency of life and love energy, as we've seen in the past, mm -hmm. the middle, the balance point of the visible spectrum of light. It can also represent gate. A gateway is a transitional point. To go through a gate means to make a transition from one point to another, and ultimately, it represents the generative principle. Now, the generative principle is the main key thing to understand about that G in the middle of the compasses in square. But unfortunately, that's all we really have time for this evening. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bob. I'll be here next Tuesday night, Mark, continuing our analysis of Freemasonry. If you want to catch the first hour of the show, check out my website at 8 p.m., and uh, I'll be going into Freemasonry in more depth then. But that's all for tonight. Okay, and as always, uh, he has his podcast, and you can catch anything that you missed at the IntelHubRadio.com. We'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, we have a program lined up for you that you're not going to want to miss, the valedictorian speech that shook up education as we know it, and so much more. That's the Intel Hub tomorrow night. So stay tuned. Me, Rogers, coming up next on Oracle Broadcasting. Good night, folks.